Good evening. Civilized towns, you look a man direct in the face when you talk to him. This isn't comfortable. Well, it's not supposed to be. Every once in a while, I see a man in that chair who could just as easily be on this side of the table. That muscle's just for show. Helps me lift stuff. We have the skills and the right to acquire proper compensation. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Film Frauds. Or myself, Matt, and my co-host, Tyler. Hello. Provider completely unprofessional, 100% biased opinions on the movies of today, tomorrow, and yesteryear. Today, we are taking a break from the modern classics to do sort of a, a broader version of the modern classic yeah. series in which we look at uh, a whole director's works, a uh, list of works in the 2010s. This time, our first time doing the series being on S. Craig Zoller who many of you who are probably film buffs know him, but if you're not so entrenched in the movie scene, he's a filmmaker that may have slipped by your radar, in which when we start discussing his movies, we think that he should be more well-known as a filmmaker, especially because his most recent movie, he was trying to get funded, Hug Penny Chicken. Yeah, Hug something Penny like Tree, that, yeah. Just like completely lost funding and he wasn't able to make it. Yeah. So S. Craig Zoller, his first movie, of uh, the 2010s and his first feature length film is Bone Tomahawk came out in 2015 2015 yes yeah 2015 followed by Braun Cell Black 99 which is probably his most well-known movie because it's Vince Vaughn's breakout role as like a dramatic actor yeah um, which came out in 2017 and then finally Dragged Across Concrete in 2018 so as you'll notice pretty much during that small space of period he had a movie coming out almost every year yeah, and then which is 20, insane. Yeah, and then since 2018 has gone completely dark. Yeah. So I watch his movies in order. So I don't know how I came across Bone Tomahawk, but when I watched it, I fell in love with it. And then I was like, when when Braun Tomahawk 99 was coming out, I was like, Tyler, we have to watch this movie. <laughs> yeah. And we did. We did. And then when Dragged Across Concrete came out, we we're both like, we need to watch three <laughs> you know, right now. We, have to, we were in college and we we're like, we have to find any means necessary to watch these movies. Yeah. And we did. And S. Craig Zoller to me stands out as kind of like um, Jim Jarmusch, actually, who we just did an episode on, as a guy who makes exactly what he wants to make. They make completely different types of movies. <laughs> yeah. But there is an energy and a sense of excitement throughout both the, throughout the entirety of a Jim Jarmusch movie and throughout the entirety of a S. Craig Zoller movie, where you get the, the idea that there's no executive influence at all. He's making exactly what he wants to make, and that's part of what I find him to be so riveting. Especially on this rewatch of him, um, when we were doing our, this is a weird comparison, but also sort of accurate. I guess he can be compared to Quentin Tarantino, I would say, to a certain extent, with like the sort of unconventional dialogue, the focus on violence, and um, this like very like masculine sort of driven films. Yeah. But when I was watching Inglorious Bastards in preparation for our Once Upon a Time in Hollywood modern classic episode, by the end of the movie, I realized that. Tarantino doesn't care about any of the characters he's made and they're all just means for him to <laughs> to cause extreme violence both to others and then to themselves at the same time where no one has any sort of sense of self-preservation okay. everyone just wants to get slaughtered um with S. Craig Zoller especially on this rewatch I noticed that he loves his characters and even when they die they seem to die with meaning and there's a level of heartfeltness to the, to his movies that I don't feel in a Tarantino movie not to say that Tarantino obviously is one of the best screenplay writers of all time. But especially when rewatching these movies, I got the sense that he loves the characters that he makes. And on this rewatch of his films, I was just riveted by the dialogue. And I also would say he's a very subtly great director as well. The way he directs Vince Vaughn, especially in Bronze Sub Black 99, like he's like this unstoppable monster among boys is incredible. <laughs> so that's my diatribe on S. Craig Zoller. I, I think this is my second watch of Brawl and Subblock and Drag Cross Concrete, my third watch of Bone Tomahawk. So what's your background with S. Craig Zoller? Uh, it basically starts with you trying to get me to watch Bone Tomahawk so I could watch that one scene for maybe like six years at this point now. Mm -hmm. Where you've been like, just you just got to watch it, Tyler. Like you've basically been imploring me. And I was like, I uh, I was even sending you like, snapchats of pictures yeah. of like i'm at think about the scene like I oh, think wait, so here. this is your first time watching so okay so this is what's really interesting is i feel like okay 
I feel like I have seen Bone Tomahawk before because when I was going into it, I was like, I think Patrick Wilson is in this movie. And I think I have faint memories of seeing Patrick Wilson in like a desaturated Western. But I, mm. I couldn't piece it together when I was rewatching or watching Bone Tomahawk, I should say. I was like, I feel like I've seen this, but like enough of it was like, I don't remember any of this. So I, I maybe I just saw like clips of it online. Like I, I can't remember. So I'm gonna just tend to say this is my first watch of Bone Tom Hawk. Uh, okay. Are, are we was watched... this your first time seeing that scene? No, that was okay. uh, that was not my first time seeing it. Uh, because out of curiosity, like everybody, you're like one day you're like, what the fuck is this scene? And you go you Google it and you watch it on your fucking shitty smartphone or whatever, and you're like, it's like this big, and you're like, I mean, it looks pretty good. And then you watch mm. it. Then we have a a big TV at my house and we watch it. I'm watching there. I'm like, Oh, okay. I can see more. Uh, it's a lot more violent than I realized, but I mean, it's the same with you. I, we watched brawl and cell block 99 and your small TV in your dorm, uh, through whatever means necessary. And, uh, and we did the same with dragged across concrete. I do want to say one thing though, that, uh, we did, uh, we did watch it by any means necessary. And that is because these, his movies make no money. I just looked it up. The biggest box office was Dragged Across Concrete, and it was like seven hundred thousand dollars was the box. On like office. a fifty million dollar budget or something crazy. No, like that. 50, 50? No, Fif his fifteen. Um, Dragged Across Concrete. I don't think he makes. I don't think his budgets. I don't think his movies are budgeted that much. Um, the mm. budget of Dragged Across Concrete. I can I can look up real quick. Uh, but it was oh yeah fifteen. God damn it, you were right. Yeah, yeah that's that research for you. Um, but I mean like Brawl and Cell Block ninety nine is a very uh like special experience watching that. I remember that so vividly. I remember passing out. Like I remember like collapsing on the <laughs> ground when it was over. We were just sitting there like on chairs, like in your room, just being like, what the fuck? And then I remember Dread to Cost Concrete. We were like, oh, okay. Like, I don't, I don't remember us. I don't remember being too particularly impressed by it at the time. And uh, we, we can talk about that when we get to it. But I mean, he is a fascinating director, like a director with true genuine talent that I just am like anything he makes I'll see like I I anything he has his hands on I want to watch because there is regardless of your thoughts on the quality of the movies maybe some stuff on it maybe even the length of the pacing of the movie or anything we can talk about with all of them he's got something really special the way he writes characters the way he shoots and directs the violence the way he shoots and composes scenes to the way he handles tension it's it's like none other, honestly, we've been seeing recently. And his movies are like a breath of genuine fresh air, like a true passion project movies. I saw an interview with him where he was saying that as like his philosophy as a director is to um, elevate the performances of the actors. And he compares, he says his great inspirations are um, John Cassavetti and Lars von Trier, um, which I would say Lars von Trier is a very flashy director. More, <laughs> He says he focuses more on the characters, I mean, on the actors and not on his own directorial style, which I, I feel like Lars von Trier is very much focused on his own directorial style, but yeah. I mean, he sees something different in, in his films. Um, but I, I definitely get that vibe in his movies. They're definitely, they're driven by the performances and the writing, even though as a story, as a director, especially as a director of violence, uh, he's very effective in that regard. But there's a discourse around S. Craig Zoller that you know a little bit more about than I do. Do you want to get into that? Yeah, so I'm going to just, everything is with kind of like a grain of salt, and this is more of uh, just like internet discourse, because if you branch out outside the internet, like this stuff doesn't really, like his, like to be as blunt as possible, his movies are not popular enough to warrant like a real life, like genuine discourse, like someone like Tarantino, where he says something about his movies and like it makes like national news, or someone like Martin Scorsese talks about Marvel movies and it becomes like a genuine mm. news story. His movies make nothing. Uh, he is not a popular director. Um, as evidenced by the fact that he managed to make three movies uh, in like four years. And especially from what I understand is he like finished Brawl and Subblock 99 and then immediately went into production on Dragon Cost Concrete. Like it was back to yeah. back. Um, there's a there's a lot of uh, like academic reading that you can kind of take into his movies being more right leaning, being more conservative leaning. And I, I think in an age of. I guess like politicized movements and stuff like that. Anything kind of associated with like right leaning is going to be uh, kind of like deconstructed or analyzed more. Uh, and that is kind of where his movies fall into right now. He's viewed as a very right leaning director. And there have been some articles that have outright painted him as MAGA. And regardless of my stances on everything, I, I think it's pretty evident from the movies that we watch and what we talk about uh, our thoughts on politics. And I, I can keep out of it. 
But like the article that kind of paints him as the next director for MAGA, I just think is like a kind of like a bad article. He doesn't really talk about it. He kind of seems like he just makes movies and he's just like, yeah, it is what it is. But we can talk about that when it comes to Drag House Concrete. There's probably more direct stuff there. But a lot of his movies, you can probably gleam some right leaning ideologies typically associated with like conservative movements in them. Uh, Bone Tomahawk, we can talk about in a bit, but the discourse of his movies are basically, he's like a right leaning director. Uh, and in an age where that's not popular um, mm -hmm. and that's not very something that is looked upon fondly, it's complicated, but it's undeniable. He has talent, but I also don't think that means that his movies aren't have value because he's, right leaning i don't think he's a maga director there's that daily beast article where i think a lot of this started um but there's also like really great film criticism um adam Naiman from the ringer has like a really really genuinely good piece of writing about dragon house concrete and about uh s craig zoller as a filmmaker which i i think if if you want to read or learn more about him from a perspective like that i would definitely check that out uh but yeah what, what do you think about that discourse does that even like matter in the grand scheme of when you're watching movies, movies make nothing like the. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's anything as egregious as like when you're talking about those who wish me dead, how there's like the the <laughs> one liberal character that they all pick apart for no yeah. reason at all. Yeah, I would even say in Drive to Cross Concrete because I've seen video essays where they only focus on certain elements of the movie, like why this is like why it's bring justice back to the cops and things like <laughs> that. And I'm and like the working man and I'm like, I'm watching the movie. And I'm like, yeah, there are elements of it, but at the same time. Like, if you're going to write dialogue between two cops, you're not going to be talking about how great of a movie Moonlight is, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, that's the thing that, yeah. Like, you need to make believable dialogue with, like, hyper-masculine men. They're not going to be talking about um, why Amazon is taking over the world or something like that. Like, yeah, it's, just, uh, yeah. it's just the type of movie he's trying to make. And I've listened to interviews with him, and he specifically said he doesn't think about politics when writing his movies. He just writes what's fun to him. And i seen interviews. He did an interview because he, um, he's a pretty prolific writer, like novelist have you read any of his books by the way no i have not and like, he had a graphic novel come out last year and like he's just he's talking to some like irish kid who has a youtube channel is like 18 years old or something like that and they're just like nerding out about comics yeah. and it's like really endearing because like this guy who's like probably twice as old as this kid is like taking is like like really actively involved in this guy this guy has kid is like 2000 subscribers on his youtube channel and like craig zoller is talking to this guy for two hours how do we get him day. on this how do we get I know, him on exactly here? he probably would be on this podcast <laughs> i i wish i'd seen that the, the, what like the channel he was talking with earlier because i think we yeah. probably could get him <laughs> on our on our show and i'd love to get him on our show yeah. um it just seems like a a really cool guy and people love to work with him like he has the same cast kind of coming in and out yeah um, because i guess he has a really calm and concentrated set people like him as a personality and it's just really a shame that he can't get the funding that he needs to make his movies because i said in my motobock review like i think if his movies came out in, like the 80s or 70s or 80s when like things were starting to get kind of dangerous and the, like we were like really like the scorsese's were coming out mm -hmm. and like violence was becoming more popular in cinema again like can you imagine that like Bontama came out in like 1985 like this guy would be a legend right yeah. now but that's kind of like those <laughs> but the best part is is like those are the type of movies he's inspired by is like these yeah. exploit exploitation movies i mean that's why he's like we can compare him to someone like tarantino's because they clearly have very similar influences um these kind of like hyper violent hyper masculine like kind of like genre films and mm -hmm. We we've had like I, I think that's also just type the movies that you and I tend to gravitate towards is like these like very weird specific like genre movies that are just odd and they yeah. just they have passion and heart and we're like oh they stand out above the rest like clearly that's what we like here and uh, even because we're gonna talk about Bontemac first like it's very cause similar to Wind River it's like the small yeah. Western story like very small concentrated story and it just yeah. it tell and it's very character focused because they don't have the budget so they don't have the yeah, but it's honestly, don't. it's insane. Like, I mean, you look at the budget for Bone Tomahawk. The budget for Bone Tomahawk is like $1.8 million. Like, Kurt Russell, Patrick Wilson, Matthew Fox, Richard Jenkins, those are, like, pretty – especially Kurt Russell. and Yeah, I guess because like, it was filmed and they filmed it in three weeks. Did they really? So that, that's what helped. Like, they were – like, again, he, he so like, credits his dollars, a filmmaker. He was able to get this movie filmed in three weeks. And he was saying yeah, in an impressive. interview, like, because they were they were running out of money. And it's like – he's, like, he's basically at the point where, like, things would be just good enough to, yeah. to, 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 to get. Yeah. And then we'll fix it in editing or something later. Yeah, that's awesome. Which, odd. I mean, considering that's the philosophy of the movie is phenomenal. Yeah, and they um, honestly I, probably I don't see any glaring direct, like, filmmaking flaws in, in the film that – 
I mean, like we we can talk about that in a second. Even like, I mean, we we can we we can talk about that because I mean, there is a clear like, I think there's a clear directorial improvement across his three movies. Um, I think they just kind of uh, look. Yeah. In even though my my rating gets lower for each sub subsequent film, I'd say he gets better as a filmmaker in it's, each subsequent it, film. Yeah, it's, it's a weird. It's like, a weird like little thing. Like yeah, like it's, yeah. But we can talk because I have thoughts about why that's probably the case. Um, but I mean, it also like Bone Tomic probably helps that like Kurt Russell just walked off the set of Hateful Eight. I mean, he has the same exact uh, yeah, he looks hairstyle, exactly the same, exactly yeah. the same. Yeah, and it's just like the must have just come off the set and be like, all right, I'm gonna do this. We're fucking <laughs> like, which I would say, Western. I would say this movie's better than Hateful Eight. Uh, personally, it's around the same for me. I gotta be okay. honest. Like they're they're yeah. like they're like pretty neck and neck in terms of like strengths and flaws. Okay. But uh, speaking of Bone Tomic, Matt, yeah. I mean, this is like. This is your Bible. This is your baby. Like, just tell me about what your thoughts on Bone Tomahawk are, your experience. It's, it's sad. I don't remember. I literally, like, I legitimately have no idea how I came across this movie. Like, I watched it, like, a, like a, I watched it on Amazon, like, a year or two after it came out. So, 2017? Did Probably. Red Letter Media do a review of it? 20, no, I, I watched the Red Letter Media video came out way after I saw it that. It came out after. Movie. Okay. Yeah. I, have, I legitimately have no idea how I came across this movie. Um, But it follows Kurt Russell as um as a sheriff of this small town. Um the these like two terrible robbers accidentally desecrate uh a ceremonial ground for i don't know what this what how this term stands today but troglodytes i don't know what it means today i'm gonna um, assume it's probably we're just gonna use it because it's used in the movie yeah, but yeah probably not the best we'll just say yeah. cannibals yeah um so like the, the, like a cannibal native american tribe yeah uh, one of the men is murdered the other escapes to the small town which then causes the cannibals to come to the small town and capture him, one of the deputies, and also the wife of Patrick Wilson, who's one of the main characters of the movie. And so Russell, um, his his uh, um, his deputy slash former Civil War surgeon, uh, Richard Jenkins, yep. this German super cool bounty hunter yeah. played by Matthew Fox, his name is Broder. <laughs> And then Patrick Wilson's character is just an average everyday man with a limp because he fell off um, his roof during construction. Go out and they're going to try to save the people that they lost. So very simple tale. Um, I did I did actually rewatch the Red Letter Media video on Bone Tomahawk. I've never days seen ago. it. Do they, do they like it? What do they think? Yeah, no, they they love it. Um, and they they start off by saying it's like it starts off like very classical Western. Like I love the shot of them all leaving the town. And as yeah. I said, like. Just looking at what they wear and their posture while riding the horses, like you know the characters immediately. And again, very slow Western at first until the last like 30 minutes where things go insane. But I want to get to the last 30 minutes later on. First of all, this movie's hilarious. I forgot how funny it is. The first scene where the two brooder guys are like, when they're walking around, they're like, oh, we're in Native American society. They're not civilized like us. As the guy's is scratching his dick with the with the <laughs> with a gun. With his, yeah, with, with the, his, the gun pointed <laughs> at his gun. dick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that that made me laugh. Um, and just from there, it's like, I compare this a lot actually to JSA by Park Chan-wook where it's like, it's this filmmaker's first like real attempt at making a movie and by God, is every scene going to be somewhat important because he doesn't know if he's ever going to get another shot again. Yeah. Um, both in subject matter and in just like the way things are shot and the way the characters are and it just feels like this guy is like feels like Zoller's like this could be my only shot so I'm gonna just put it all out there and we'll see what happens it feels risky in that regard so you said that you I'm not I'm, this is a five star movie for me five yeah. stars I love it you said four stars so you think that in in your view you said that it takes too long to get to like the actual meat of the movie. Do you want to talk me through like the character development that just not work for you? Or do you just think that the pacing was too slow? Yeah. So I think we should, I think we should start off by saying like the shortest of his movies is about two fifteen. I think his shortest. Yeah. Bone Tomahawk is the shortest at two fifteen. Yeah. So it goes like two fifteen, like two twenty. Two and a half and then two forty. Okay. Yeah. It's like his movies are long and he, he is a, he, so the start at like the, I immediately was impressed by this movie by the opening shot of it being a guy being like his neck being slit, yeah. but not being slit in the conventional mo movie sense, but you hear like bones crunching because it's a dull knife. So we kind of just like crush it. It's the first shot of the movies. You just hear it and it like, you can tell. And what I respect about this movie is it's pretty bold with it's like how it takes its time, how it knows exactly what it is trying to do and how it works to get there. It feels like a very, uh, 
like realized movie from a director with a vision. And that, I mean, we alone is something I respect more than anything else. I think for me, something that is remedied in Brawl and Subblock 99 is I think that just the characters don't support the pace and the length of the movie. Um, they okay. are good characters, but I think at a certain point- We're gonna point, fight. I'm we're gonna fight about it. Though. I'm fine with that. <laughs> I think I think there is just a, there's a sequence when they are uh, besieged upon by uh, bandits. Yeah. And it's just like it it the purpose of it is to like slow down the characters a little bit. And I think there are just choices made in the the pacing of it that with the 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 stuff that we get with the characters, I just think wasn't as interesting because I think at a certain point you didn't love the scene where Matthew Fox is like, There's no way Greece would ride my horse. Yeah, and, and then, then it's like, like, Oh, you teach a bigotry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then it's like I think it actually put up a fight and he puts down the horse. Yeah. Yeah, That's but it's so emotional. Like Matthew again, Matthew Fox. He, I mean, he gives the best performance of this movie for me. I disagree. But it also by the way. discredits how great everyone else is in the movie too. Like when I say Matthew Fox is the best in the movie, yeah. I don't. I think it's also underserving how great Richard Jenkins, Russell, uh, Kurt Russell, and yeah. uh, Matt Patrick Wilson are because they're yeah. all they're all phenomenal actors given real characters to play, <laughs> like real so stuff to work with. Yeah, it's like what we said with, with Mark Ruffalo and poor things. Like, oh, this is what an actor does when they have a real character to play. Yeah, like they just they just can destroy the scenery because they're given they're not bruce banner they're like yeah. a real person um i i really think it comes down to like uh and I, i'm gonna this is essentially kind of like a, something i took from the that of name review i read is like um he uh, like zaller seems to like enjoy punishing the audience for staying with the tension and then punishing the audience for having like stick with the movie like punishing you through the the actual tension like a lot of this movie is character like you you so what Eskrick Dollar does that is really great. And I frankly might even talk myself into liking this movie more. And I, I think when I give it four stars, I think like, I can't stress enough. Like that is a very high four star rating. Like this is a very good movie, but immediately in the movie, Eskrick Dollar establishes the savagery, the monstrosity of the threat. You, you see the opening scene is the, the, the savagery of humans is only topped by the savagery of these, these cannibals. Um, they, they kill an innocent, like, uh, uh, what's it called? Like stable boy by yeah. slitting his throat and then stabbing him through the head with a tomahawk. Um, and you kind of like you get a sense of the violence, and then the next hour thirty is the slow build to the adventure. It. It's just it's I wanted it to be an hour longer. <laughs> you just want you want Richard Jenkins to get excited about fleas. Yes, I <laughs> and want to be more like the diatribes. Deputy. I just want I want Matthew. I want uh Bruder Matthew Fox's character to just be as like nasty to everyone as possible and for i him want to patrick wilson to, to be to looking at his wound and his leg <laughs> i just yeah, want yeah. more <laughs> so it's it's basically maybe an hour and a half is exaggerating it but it's a solid at least 75 minutes of them just because there's even sequences that i think take conventional expectations where um they get close to where the caves are and there's this shot where uh they like they have a hill behind them and there's this shot where they kind of pan out. So you see the crest of the hill, then pan in, then pan out again. And in I feel like in like typical horror movies, or you would see someone over there to keep the tent, but it doesn't. It it constantly is like luring you in and out and in and out until eventually There's always like this threat that you don't even know if they're going the right way. Yeah, exactly. They're like, I they're like, I think it's like, like, is I that think, the case? I think they're over here. Yeah, and then they get there, and then we can talk about the violence and the presentation of it, which I do love, and I, I can tell you love too. But I really think it's this. My my faults with the movie are with the pacing and the characters. I like the characters, but I don't know if they support a movie like this. If the movie was like 20 minutes shorter, I think it kind of works a little better. I think that is remedied remedied in Brawl and Cell Block 99. Okay. I like adore the first hour of that movie okay. before you like absolutely adore it. Because I think the characters are a lot better written. But then again, this is a man, like you said, who had his fucking go of it. Like, he's like, this is my first movie. You can tell there's first director flaws. You can tell they start to get improved a little bit. Uh, but what about you? You you said you're going to disagree. I just went on a fucking 35-minute diatribe. What do you think? An S. Craig Zoller S. diatribe. Yeah. Um, I just love how unique all the characters is. Like, Patrick Wilson, like, with this Aquaman Fargo season two, he's always given, like, the most, like, white meat character but he always <laughs> makes it so interesting like when yeah. he like when he's when, he, when he's uh, looking at his wound he's, he's like god damn it god damn it then he looks at this guy he goes i'm sorry like <laughs> that it's so adorable to me um that he does that and like richard jenkins like the 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 civil war surgeon like he's kind of like a, a simpleton 
kind of character. A or dumb like, imbecile, yeah. Yeah, but then like there's like weird moments of da of like depth where he talks about being a surgeon in the Civil War and it's like how he's like watch people like die. Or from, his wife. Yeah, or yeah, like his wife's just said, things yeah. like that, like weird amounts of, of depth to them. Um is this something you vibe with or you like you or you don't vibe with? And for me, like I honestly probably could have watched them travel for another 30 minutes. Just <laughs> I'm just being completely honest. Like I, yeah. I could have. Um I, I was really just like floored by the dialogue here and the, the performances. Cause again, these, these characters, these actors are given real characters to play. Um, so due to the fact that we're talking about the three movies, let's get to, we got to talk about the, we got to talk about the ending of Bone Tomahawk first. Though. Yeah. But I just yeah. want to talk about the first like real moment of violence. How, again, it's like an hour and a half of buildup. They've left Patrick Wilson behind. And then like, they're at the, they see like the mouth of the cave and they're like, all right, let's plan it. And they start planning and halfway through the plan, just like things to start getting thrown at them. And you don't even know if it's like a rock or something. It's a you rock. Don't know, I, it's, or, it's, or it's like a blunt weapon or something. Yeah, it's one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Or like a bone, but you don't know what it is. All of a sudden, like, like things are, just get thrown at them. And you just, and like, again, Zoller's, the sounds of violence in his movies, it's just, it's just dry. Yeah. Like there's no, there's nothing like particularly like, like cinematic about like, it's like, like, it's just, yeah. it's, 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 it's like, and then you see like a like a blood gash come out, but then again, it's like it's happening so fast that the characters aren't even reacting to like the pain because they can't even process it. It's just yeah. all of a sudden they're being attacked, and I think it's brilliant in a way because again, it's like an hour and a half of riding to this to what you think is going to be like the first like real like fight scene, and it just comes out of nowhere. Yeah, Bruder gets murdered. Almost, it's like almost dead. Yeah, he gets he gets. Uh, his hand cut off and like Ryan and like Kurt Russell and Roger Jenkins are just like like are all bleeding from the head yeah. and stuff like that. They barely survived their first encounter. And and in Matthew Box case he doesn't survive his first encounter. But yeah, spoilers um, by the way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well I mean yeah we're talking about but it's like the and then and then two minutes later um Jenkins and Russell are just walking and then they get immediately attacked by two of the of the cannibals and then get taken away. Like they, yeah. they barely put up a fight. But what do you think? Because like my jaw, especially on a rewatch, I still I, I didn't see it coming. Like I forgot the first fight scene really. And like my jaw dropped and like all the things that start getting thrown. Yeah. And again, he holds the shot too. So you're just seeing these guys just casually talking and all of a sudden things are getting thrown at them yeah. and they're getting like, you know, hurt and maimed. It's great. I mean, it's, it's so anti-cinematic and uh, like it goes from like Matthew Fox's character gets hit with a rock. Kurt yeah. Russell gets shot with an arrow in the arm and it's like, and the immediate start, like it's really, and then Richard Jenkins gets hit with a rock too. And then, they kill a couple of the cannibals, and then Matthew Fox is like, "I'm gonna take them out. Uh, like, don't come back with a dynamite. Dynamite I got too never much pride to be a cripple. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> I got too much. I'm too vain to be a cripple. Just let me die. And he's like, don't come back until the dynamite explodes. No dynamite ever goes off in this movie. They no. talk about it. All it's like an anti Chekhov's gun. Yeah, no dynamite has ever exploded. Matthew Fox is like, I'm gonna take as many out because then he reveals he's like I killed 116, and you're like, I killed oh, his shit. family. Yeah, you're like, oh yeah. shit, like he's gonna do it. And he he kills one and immediately is murdered. Like it's yeah. like everything is done. And it's even like you said, like Kurt Russell and Richard Jenkins in movies are not um your atypical action, like Charles Bronson figures of men. They're old men. They get and they're doing very, very physical performances. That's true. He's movie. getting choked out is really yeah. like it looks great. Um yes. no, it's awesome. Like it's it's genuinely or like, like those the cannibals like fall on them at one point. And like Richard yeah. Jenkins, like that's Richard Jenkins getting a, a grown man <laughs> fall, have him fall on him as he lands on rocks. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, like this is this is an old man. Um it's great. And I mean I can I can hundred percent see why you're just like I gravitate towards this and like Action can come in many different forms and it can come in the hyper stylized John Wick. It can come in the shaky cam. It can come in the brutal reality realism, uh, re real realism blah, of this movie where it's just like, oh, man, it's over. Like, it's done. Like, it's a quick combat. People don't get shot with arrows nine times and really get back up. They they get shot once and they kind of lose their arm mobility a bit. Like, it's and pretty like, awesome. I, like, I, I understand that, like, like a John Wick fight scene is a different is like yeah. basically in a different genre than Bone Tomahawk, but I do, I love, again, this movie does hold on the action to a certain extent, but I just, like the over choreographed stuff feels, it's fun, but it doesn't, it doesn't capture like the, the insanity of like a real fight. Like yeah. I think Bone Tomahawk does where it's like you blink and like all of a sudden you're like, you're about to die. Yeah. You're dead. Like that's <laughs> it. Like you get hit, you blink and you just got hit with a rock. You're like, yeah. ah, it's, yeah. it's crazy. It's awesome. Um, I was saying the movie, my only, issue with the movie is that I think the Native Americans become a little incompetent when fighting they, Patrick Wilson's character. He's a like, cripple again, with like they, a they, real they absolutely bad demolish leg. three of them with only losing like two guys and then all of a sudden 
like Patrick Wilson comes hobbling up and they're all like, what? <laughs> and they, they, fly yeah, and they, fall, and they, that's it, they die. Yeah. Um, that was a little silly to me. But again, what I think Zeller does here is that he sets up such horrific villains and such sympathetic heroes that even on a rewatch, I was so emotionally engaged in getting uh, Kurt Russell, Richard Jenkins and Patrick Wilson's wife out of that cave because when they show that scene with the guy getting torn apart, it's great. Um, you realize that they're just in this dire situation yeah. and it's either they escape or they get brutally murdered. Um, what do you think about that cave sequence real quick? And then we can, we can yeah. talk about brawl and cell block. Yeah. I think it's masterful. Everyone talks about the, um, like the, the, the guy getting ripped apart scene, but I, I, I wish that the, the imagery of Kurt Russell, like standing up with like the, 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 the whiskey flask falling out of his gut was yeah. a, was a more iconic. Cause that's like, that's an, that's an awesome image. It is. Awesome and I image, wish like yeah. it got more credit. Because I love that image of him doing that, and yeah. the scene where where Kurt Russell decides to get left behind, and Richard Jenkins is, and he says to Richard Jenkins, "I'll say hi to your wife if you yeah, say, or say goodbye to, to my wife. I'll say hi to yours." Kind yeah, of thing. That's yeah, a great exactly. line. Yeah, exactly. Um, love that scene again. It's like if this is a Tarantino movie, like that would not have happened. <laughs> Everyone would have been brutally murdered. Um, <laughs> you, just, you just want people to die. You just want you want to care about people. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I just. It, I'm just so emotionally satisfied when and like even now thinking about it again, I just like the catharsis of these characters rising above this horrible evil is so great to me. And like I, I love violence in a movie if it has the gravitas and the emotional uh, care to back it up. I'm I'm down for anything. Um, and I think that Zala represents that perfectly. Like this isn't like an Eli Roth like slaughter fest where nothing really matters. Um, this is like a movie that is carefully yeah. crafted. You don't like Cabin Fever? Come on. No. Come on, cat or cannibal. I hate, I hate okay, torture well, movies. Green Inferno. I hate I hate him Saw. too. I, I can't watch Saw. I hate him. I hate him yeah. too. They just I find them so boring and dumb. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh yeah. I, I will I think like it's pretty impressive, honestly, like the practical sets as well. Like I just want to be I want to be clear. Like I, I'd rather watch this than like a thousand other movies. Like I just like I respect something like this. And even that little moment, my favorite part of the movie is uh uh, they just it feels so dire like Nick the scene has happened so Deputy Nick yeah. has been and then like and then the, the characters like they take so much time to show the characters just be like like they just yeah, like, like lean we're back fucked. and they, yeah. have, they have no idea what to do because they just witness this horrific evil like the the movie understands the emotional impact of watching a person get torn apart yeah. characters need to sit and reflect <laughs> and just be like we're fucked like that's it we're done yeah. um but the little dialogue where Richard Jenkins is trying to be helpful where he's talking about like circus fleas. Yeah. And he's like, I knew they were, he's like so excited. That's my favorite part of the movie. That's like the best characterization is this like, this guy who like throughout it all has witnessed like the most horrific acts he's ever probably seen despite being a, a, an actual war surgeon. Because mm. I mean, like there's a different, like saving people versus like watching someone be torn apart, I imagine is different. But he's just like, I love those fleas. I'm just so glad they're real. And again, real. he's kind of like a joke in the first half, but then by the second half, he's a real character. A that character, you, yeah. Like, and you like, a, again, the bravery of these men, like, sat, like, putting themselves in such a risky situation to go rescue their own is, yep. you know, really admirable. Do you think Patrick Wilson loses that leg at the end? I feel like he does. That thing is not uh, good. Yeah, I would, because then he has to walk back. There's no he has horses. to walk back, yeah. yeah. I don't, do you think, this is also my question, is like, do you think they survived their walk back? I like yeah, I would I would say so. I'd like to hope the too. The heroic music's playing, of course they make it back. Yeah, they blow what? the little, the throat whistle and you hear the three gunshots and he throws yeah. the rock down cinematically and he's like, there's no more threat. Yeah. I was like, that's nice. Um, yeah. Do you have any I was, final thoughts? I was going to say in an interview, because like talking about like the potential racism involved with like portraying Native Americans in that way. Yeah. Um, Zoller does say that it's like a combination genre of like a Western and like an, like an alternate race story, which... Yeah. He was saying that like the Virginian was was like the, said to be the first Western novel ever came out like came out around the same time as like the first ever alternate race. So he doesn't consider these these this tribe to be like a Native American race. He considers it to be like an alternate like form of humanity to a certain extent. So yeah, I watched like a I watched like a a, a video essay where someone's like this movie's racist, and I'm like the the Native American character at the start says these people aren't like the Native American character in the in the. The learned goat says that like these aren't humans, like we don't consider them our own. So yeah, and that's that's yeah. where like some of the criticism I saw is like is like that character is like represent. It's a lot of different stuff, and like it's it's kind of lazy to do that. Like I feel like just I I will agree it's kind of lazy to have like one Native American character saying like he's not one of us. Yeah, he's and like then oh, have the character disappear for the rest of the movie. Yeah, he's not part. But, of the movie, so I understand yeah. that, but also at the same time, I think it's disingenuous to say that 
Zoller's is typecasting all Native Americans as being cannibals because because they clearly make a note that this is not the case. Yeah, and honestly, yeah. like it's it's one of the things of like I I this is what I do appreciate about art is like we can all just read into it and we can mm. look and we can but like I think it's also okay to recognize like maybe the portrayal isn't the best doesn't devalue from the fact that it's a pretty good fucking movie like it's like yeah. yeah I, again, because I don't think I don't think Zoller's trying to make a political statement. I think he just had an idea for a really cool. He liked he liked movie. exploitation and horror he, westerns. Yeah, yeah and he's just like I want to make it. I want to make a yeah. like a classic like he wanted to do like a like what's the what's the term like cowboys and Indians, but like yeah. they get more violent. And regardless yeah. if that has aged out of um being a, a appropriate or a contextual, I still think it's a pretty fucking good movie, and I still yeah. like what he does. Like I think it comes mm -hmm. down to it. Yeah, Matt, is this your favorite? We don't. I don't want to spoil. Is this your favorite S. Craig Zoller movie? Yeah. This is my second favorite. We can... And your first favorite, I'm assuming, is Braun Sublock 99. Yeah, do you want to tell us a little bit about that one? This is this is my baby. This one, this one's all mine. <laughs> this okay. one is. <laughs> this one's all yours. All right. So the general plot, because we're already 50 minutes into recording, um, is <laughs> Vince Vaughn is the coolest guy in the world. He's a psychopath <laughs> and he's trying to live a normal life where he gets fired from his job as a mechanic or something. Um, ends up making a ton of money selling drugs. And then a, a deal goes wrong. He gets arrested. We'll go into specifics of that later on and gets thrown to prison. Turns out the drug cartel he was working with has captured his wife and says that you need to go into like the worst of the worst cells, cell block 99, kill a guy for us. And then we won't kill your wife and your unborn baby. And so he has to consider commit a series of horrendous acts to be put into cell block 99. And then just... You know, Adam Sandler esque shenanigans ensue <laughs> throughout the course of the movie. Tyler, what are your thoughts? <laughs> is this is this one of your favorite first watch experiences you've ever had? Yes, I yeah, me too. <laughs> I, I still vividly remember the final, like the actual brawl in Cell Block ninety nine. Yeah, like completely vividly. Same here. <laughs> do you remember? Uh, do you remember the? Do you ever watch Disney XD when you were younger? Yes. Do you remember the show Pair of Kings? No. Okay. Well, one of the guys from Pair of Kings is one of the bad guys in uh in Brawl Sub Okay. He, he's the guy with the really deep voice. Oh. He's okay. like, fuck you, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so this is like this is uh and I don't want to spoil my thoughts on Dread Cross Concrete, but I think this is uh the best movie S. Greg Zoller's made. I think it's the best realization of probably what he's going for, which is with like genuine human great writing with like genre exploitation, with narrative emotional beats that I think really, really work. Um, it's I, I took note. It's an hour and 10 minutes before cell block 99 is mentioned. Uh, this movie is two really? hours and 18 minutes long. Wow. It's an hour and 10 minutes before uh, I think he goes to prison uh, and like actually things start. Um, the first hour of this movie is pure buildup. It's showing Vince Vaughn as this. One, he frames him very well in this movie. I think it's I, I think it's a really well directed movie. But Vince Vaughn in the most atypical role he's ever done outside of like trying to remake the shitty psycho movie, like in like the 90s well, or whatever. Interesting, he had true talked about season two before this. He did, and yes. When, that was his first attempt at like a dramatic role. Yes. And it received with mixed reviews. Yeah. This was it's, his first successful and, and like tremendously successful dramatic performance. Yeah, he's really fucking good and he's so good in it. Um, this is also I don't want to bring back to the controversy, but we, we can talk about this more in uh because casting is kind of a big thing uh, in Drag to Cost Concrete, we'll talk about. Um, despite being the really hot in the movie, Mel Gibson is in Drag to Cost Concrete. But Vince <laughs> you Vaughn, sound like Snapchat last I just hear Snapchat, and I was like, he is really hot. Um, Vince Vaughn is a is a known Hollywood conservative. Um, mm. He he is a he is a like an NRA supporter. Like I don't want to talk about politics, but I just want to shine some more light on that. Um, movie is basically about a a broken man who you start off the movie. He's fired. He's polite he uh, uh what is it uh south of okay north of cancer is like one of my yeah, favorite lines I love that he line. loves it he's always just like howdy he's this like seemingly mild-mannered guy who is who is clearly like hiding some simmering rage he get he's a representative of the working class he's a representative of the everyday man the man who uh just wants to provide for his family just wants to to live a good life and he's fired from his uh blue collar job because of budget cuts there's a lot of commentary. You can talk about that with economic classes. He goes home and his wife has been having an affair. And uh, because of an emotional distance, because he lost a baby, I think, in a miscarriage. Well, also because uh, he, he's been working late. He's been working late. And she, thought, she thinks yeah. that he's cheating on her. And, and he's, he's like, just no, fighting. I was just working really I'm just hard. working or working out. And here she's like, oh, 
Um, the movie starts with this, uh, you get this simmering rage of violence as Vince Vaughn destroys a car, yeah. um, which I thought was really impressive stunt work. Uh, and then it kind of, he kind of resigns himself. He's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to basically run drugs for this guy named Gil. Uh, and then it just cuts 18 months later. He has a nicer car, pretty, pretty like simple, effective filmmaking. Like it just cuts and he's a nicer car. And you're like, oh, things have been going well. He has nice his wife. His, he, yeah. yeah, his, his relationship is fixed and Gil wants him to run a job uh, with this uh, Eliezer. So the moral of the story is sell drugs and sell drugs. And that's not a very conservative it. message, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, this, uh, there is a lot of like, the prison system's pretty bad. Um, yeah. Look how, look how, yeah. Um, again, that's, that's fairly that's, liberal. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a little bit sound. There's interesting there. there there's a stuff there. So basically Doug, drug deal goes wrong. Uh, the bad guys are shooting at cops. He's like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I don't want that to happen. He kills one of the bad guys, stops the other one, gets arrested, doesn't turn him in, gets sent to prison. And then in like a comically goofy fashion, like an old ass henchman is like, we will, a, a Korean. He's the wise and figure to yeah, teach him the ropes. He, he, who was also in Dragged Across Concrete. He has a lot of recurring mm, actors yeah. um, who basically is like, we have a, and I, I'm, I'm going to like, we have a Korean abortionist who can come in and s remove the limbs of your baby. And unless you get sent to this detention center, maximum facility, kill this guy, we are going to send you the limbs of your aborted baby. Yep. Uh, good luck. And then yeah. that's the movie. And then you basically go from there. Uh, Matt, I love this movie. Like, I got to be honest. This is one of my favorite movies of the 2010s. Really? I fucking love this movie. I love Vince Vaughn. Were you, it. so was this surprising to you in a rewatch how much you loved it? It's been fond in my memory since. And it okay. wasn't surprising how I, I remember. It's really funny to like think about watching that in college, like not really watching a ton of movies and just being like, this is the craziest shit ever. And now you watch it now and you're like, this is fucking awesome still. Like a lot of it still holds up. A lot of how he works to just overcome stuff, the stuff he goes through, the slow descent into hell. It's all amazing. Um, but is this like, what do you think of this movie? Like you watched it with me. I think you're pretty high on it. Um, the time. movie like flies by. It's two hours and 20 by. minutes. And I don't think I, I didn't like at one point I looked at the clock and like an whole hour went by and I had no, I was so absorbed in yeah. the film. Like, yeah, the, like the slow descension. It's like Dante's Inferno esque, like the slow descension into hell, where it's like you start off in like the the basic cell block, and it gets progressively worse, and the environment reflects that. It's kind of like Soviet Union esque, uh, yeah. like the first cell block, like very dry, blunt colors, and then like by the end, you're like in a medieval torture dungeon, and there's literally <laughs> no light at all, and there's broken glass everywhere. Yeah, um, loved it. I would say it's a better directed movie than Bone Tomahawk. I'd say my only flaw with the movie comes at the end where I think it, where um where the where the the wife is rescued, I think is a bit silly. Um, I think I think it's perfectly in line with the rest of the movie. Okay, yeah. I mean, yeah. I I, I can I mean, I understand why people think this is the best as Craig Zoller movie. I just think that Bone Tomahawk like the the emotion there is just a little more resonant for me. Yeah. Um but this is a really great movie. Even like small things, like when um when Bradley like to show how dedicated Bond is the performance. Like when Bradley goes in the water to hide under the docks, then he climbs yeah. the pole by himself. Like it's that's, like that's all minutes. one shot too. Yeah. yeah. Um, his sacrifice is there. So many great quips. Like when the when the two Mexican guys are in the shit with the cops, and he goes and he goes. The guy goes ready for nine eleven part two. <laughs> <laughs> he throws the grenade. It's like the smallest explosion ever. It doesn't There's even no kill anybody. No fire yet. Just yeah. Like, ready for nine. I forgot about that line. Ready for nine eleven part two. Like that's definitely a line where, where Zoller was like, he probably just went for a walk. And then like it, like it hit him and he went, I gotta get home and write that down right yeah, now. Yeah, I, I gotta get the, the guy with the deepest voice imaginable to be like, yeah. part two and you're and I was like, oh shit. Um, it's such a great movie. It's a movie that like at the end of, let's say, Bone Tomahawk, when Kurt Russell is sacrificing himself and stuff like that, and whether or not the mileage of the emotional beats hit, uh, the ending of this movie, the emotional beats when he gets to finally like talk to, I like, I got a little choked up. I'm not going to lie. Like mm. I was like in when he talks yeah. to, so I don't want to spoil it, but I'm going to recap a lot of this. He gets sent to cell block 99. It's a secret prison within the prison. There's no freedoms. It's, it's sort of like a hidden torture dungeon cave, uh, with like all the worst type of people. And Vince Vaughn is, uh, like pushed and pushed and he finds a way to overcome. He basically takes control of the prison. He goes and uh, there turns out there is no guy. They just want to torture him and yeah. kill him. Uh, and then so he basically kills everybody. 
an awesome fight. There's that one take where he's fighting the boxing guy. It's all in one take, and I was like, yeah. "Usman's doing this. This is great." Um, he then, even though in the, his first fight with with the security guard, like that's all one take. Yeah, where he's doing yeah. that, where the guy he punches him, and the guy's like with the baton. He's like, "You know what? Do? And both of he's, them are huge guys. Yes. Usman's a huge guy. It's so great." It's so awesome. I, I This is the movie with the least amount to say because I think it's the simplest. It's a working man does whatever he can to, to save his family um, with like prison genre exploitations and absurd amount of violence and Vince Vaughn with my favorite performance of his. It, it's insane. It, mm. It's so fucking good. It's so good. Um, Yeah, I just like I got the attention to detail in the setting and also – weirdly a complex character study as well of, of a guy who has extreme power and it takes like every ounce of energy for him to not to just exert it on people it's <laughs> yeah. so, like for example when he first beats the sec the security guard and he's like oh you should be you should join our boxing club and and, and bradley's like like i don't like I don't use violence unless it's absolutely necessary to use it yeah and then later on when the, when he gets the message that he's like oh you got to go to the brawl cell block you got to go to cell block 99 or we're gonna you know murder your family and then as he's leaving to go back up, the security guard's like, hey, man, like, I'm sorry. I was rough yeah. on you before. Like, he's apologizing. Yeah, and you see and he's like, like he's Bradley's, and Bradley's like, just oh. like, oh, my God, I'm going to have to do this. Like, yeah. it's like it's like the darkest type of humor where but also you feel bad for Bradley at the same time because it's like he like the worst possible time for this guy to apologize happens when he has to maim him basically in order yeah. to go into cell block yeah. 99. Again, tremendous like fight choreography. And again, like long takes, but the the fights don't feel choreographed. They feel real. And that part of us to do with the sound effects that Zala uses as well. Yeah. It and is, yeah. This movie also introduced me to Don Johnson, who This was your I, introduction to Don Johnson? At least like as like an old like as someone who could like comprehend who actors were. Like not, I can't, not I can't cold remember. Not in July. He's in Cold in July. Oh, did I see this? Did I see Cold in July first? You I might definitely have seen saw Cold in July. Okay, you, never you mind. Cold that. in July is my introduction. So. Yeah. Don Johnson, but like this movie further emphasized that he's one of the best actors to ever live. Awesome, yeah. He is so good in this movie. And it's like, yeah, just like the, the bleakness of like at some point, especially as an adult now, it's like you realize he's not gonna he's not he's not gonna get a cell block 99. Like there's no escape. Like I think when I was younger, I was like, how's he gonna get out of this? And he's yeah. like, no, that's the point is um like he's not getting out and he knows this. And every so everything he's doing now is completely selfless. Yeah. Um what else do you want to say about this movie? Like what else stuck, stuck out to you? Like, why is this, why is this S Craig Zoller at his best? I think it's, I think it's a pure recognition of the genre. When he gets into okay. the maximum security facility, he goes to the courtyard and like every other prison movie, the main character, yeah, the first like, guy, someone like, comes hey, up, man, I'm going to show he, you the yeah, show, And he's like, I'm fucking psycho. And then beats the shit out of a yeah. bunch of people. And it's like four minutes. And it's just a complete, like, you're like, Oh, we're about to get like a, we're he's cause you know, he's like, Oh, I have to get to cell block 99. And you get the real, like, immediately he learns, he's like, oh, Cell Block 99 is, like, the worst of the worst. Like, you don't go down there. And he's like, well, I know what I got to do. Like, and it's immediate. You expect because the pacing of the movie is so slow. The tension of the movie is so slow. That you're just waiting for this buildup. You're like, wow, now he has to figure out how to do it. No, nope, he just goes over there, beats the shit at people in Cell Block 99 immediately. And it's, like, this great, like, S. Craig Zoller knows what type of movie he's making. He knows the confines of the genre and is working to either like twist them a little bit or to navigate it. And I was in the same boat as you. You're like, how is he going to get out of this? You're like, there's no way Vince Vaughn's going to die. And then that final moment where he's on the, when he's, you know, there's a certain point you're like, Hey, he's not getting out of this. Like, yeah, he's going to, like, he's going to die. And that realization I think is really great. Um, I do genuinely think this is Vince Vaughn. Like if there's a, out of all the performances in S. Craig Zoller movies, which is only three, this is like, I think leagues in a leagues above every other person in every other movie. We can talk about drag across concrete, um, and maybe Mel Gibson in a second, but uh, like it's, it's just he's so good in it, and I think I'm I'm, I think a lot of it is I'm just very like drawn to whatever Vince Vaughn is doing here, the humanity, the the like the simmering rage, the the cross on the back of his head, like it's really really fascinating work, um, and you know I think it's all I think it's tongue in cheek, it's I mean the scene where Gil like rescues the wife and he pulls a gun out of the flowers. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and it just like shoots the slow moving backup. I think S. Craig Zeller knows, and I think it's shown by the final shot in the movie, uh, which is a uh, I don't want to spoil it, but is a a clear like not even an attempt to hide. It's a dummy. Vince Vaughn yeah. gets what his head explodes, and it's a dummy. 
Um, yeah. And I also think it's just the emotional beats work. I think when he's sitting there talking to his wife and talking to the- Wait, the, me, Vince Vaughn didn't, didn't die? No, he didn't die. He, he was okay. so- unca- But that final line of like 78 days until the baby's born, he gets shot and shot. Like all of it to me is just so- Like there's just like, you know how Bone Tomahawk for you, it just works. Brawl yeah. and Sawbuck 99 just works for me. It's mm. it's a movie like I'm going to go out and buy on Blu-ray to own forever so it doesn't get lost in the annals of time. Like I will remember this movie and I will watch it again and I will revisit it much sooner- what has it been like seven years probably since the last time mm. I saw it? Then again, I just, I love it. Like, I gotta be honest, I adore okay. this movie. And I like, I gave it four and a half out of five stars, so I love yeah, I it too. It, but yeah. um, I just think Bone Tomax is a little bit better. Next up, probably his most controversial movie, Drive Across budget. Concrete. Um, I don't really know how to recap the plot to this movie because I don't, I don't feel like I firmly understood what exactly happened. But basically, <laughs> there are multiple sides, including two cops played by Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn, who um, are suspended and they don't have any money. Vince Vaughn is trying to pay for his wife's engagement ring, and Mel Gibson is trying to pay to get his family out of the crappy neighborhood they live in. And so they decide they're going to rob bank robbers who are um, stealing gold from this bank vault, who then also employ a character named Henry, who and his friend who are like two african-american inner city guys in this fictional town called bulwark and it all culminates in this really long and insane fight scene at shootout scene at the end very strategic also a fight scene at the end it's, it's very cool. slow paced so, where do we even begin yeah with, where do we begin with, with this, this one i think we have to talk about the uh the discourse with this movie yeah it's a two-hour and also there's a baby named Jackson whose mom's not coming home. We joked about that in our last episode. So too yeah. with that the most memorable thing is his mom's give this to Jackson. Um my baby's name Jackson. His name is Jackson. Um <laughs> so this is the one where I can see the arguments for some of the discourse. Yeah. Um let's start off by saying this is a movie about we can start from the basis about two corrupt cops. Mm. One both who are fired for uh, using excessive force against minorities. One is played by Mel Gibson. Uh, yeah. I do not think you need uh, us to talk about why Mel Gibson is a controversial figure. <laughs> um, there is no denying. Because of the libs. Because of the libs. The libs canceled Mel Gibson. <laughs> I, don't, I was going to make... That's oh going to be, be time. Li- <laughs> that's going to come back to bite me. The liberals. They're the ones who canceled Mel Gibson. He's just trying to do his job. <laughs> so bad. Now, Mel Gibson's probably not a good person in real life. Like, let's be real. Like, he he's he said a lot of anti-Semitic stuff. Um, but it's also interesting. Love is all is Jewish. So it is like, but like, this is the thing where it, it's like, it's like he people he are ta- people are uh, complicated. <laughs> but but this is this is that the exact this is the exact thing where he's like, I don't make my movies political. And then he cast yeah. Mel Gibson, and it's really hard to but argue. Like part against- of the mark, I I distinctly remember the marketing of this movie was that because this is, so I mean, Black Panther came out around this time. This is when movies were starting to make the push of like we're using, like, more progressive themes as like a marketing tactic. And part yeah. of the marketing for this movie was that Mel Gibson isn't politically correct in the film. Yeah. I, I distinctly remember reading that as like part of its marketing. So but, take that. But, but but that's again like how can he then say like I'm not political? And but his yeah. all argument is because in the interview he's like, did you cast with Mel Gibson? He's like, I just cast him because I like Mel Gibson. He's a great actor. And it's like, yeah, man. But well, like, who knows if he's in charge of the of the marketing? Like he's that's not saying the marketing. He's... I'm talking about the casting. Like he's like, I didn't write this with Mel Gibson in mind. I wrote this, and then I Mel Gibson. I I thought was the best person. And it's like, yeah, man. But it's like mm. it was 2017, 2018. Like Mel Gibson was a known figure. Yeah, he directed Hacksaw Ridge, which is a great movie, by the way. Yeah. We'll cover yeah. that one day. He's a great filmmaker. <laughs> he's a great film. Like it's no denying that Mel Gibson is probably the best part of this movie. Well, I think his his voice messages came out in like the twenty the the two thousands, right? Like Mel that... Gibson. Yeah, I thought he was he was arrested for the anti-Semitic. Like that was the whole thing. Is like he was he on, arrested for that? I thought was he was he, like he's like a DUI. he was blacklisted. He was blacklisted for a bit because he came out with like major like anti-Semitic like rants. Well, yes, drunk. yeah. It, but like also, okay. if you watch the Passion of Christ, like there's no surprise. There's no surprise there. That, yeah, this, this is a very uh, very uh, you know not a great man. So it's it's hard to argue that yeah. a large content of this movie is also 
right leaning, and there's you could argue against the, it. Yeah, Vince Vaughn is the also is also the other lead of the movie. Vince Vaughn's the other lead. The yeah. the Mel Gibson's wife is. Which I mean, ex- he hasn't said anything anti-Semitic, Vince, so no. like he's not. I'm not trying to group Mel Gibson no, no, and, but and it's Vince Vaughn like the same category. Just saying that. Yeah, they're two right leaning characters, yeah. but also like Mel Gibson's wife is like I'm as liberal as an ex cop. Like his his daughter is assaulted by like young black teens like yeah. multiple times. It's really on the nose. There's a scene where. Uh, Vince Vaughn, uh, Mel Gibson, and Don Johnson are in, and they're like they're just decrying cancel culture. And but like, that scene ends with Don Johnson saying, "You went too far." He does, Gibson, he does. Right? But there are little things where you, it starts to does sound like it's a little bit on a soapbox, a little bit. Some of the stuff, I think it's also like we're we're such a politicized, I, I think, like media nation that like anytime mm. there's an argument, it just it's very uh, Fox News. It's very yeah. Fox News, and it's very Fox News language and arguments, and the libs are canceling and blah blah blah. Like it's kind of stuff yeah, like, compared like that. to like McCarthyism, which is like completely like McCarthyism was about lying and like pretending that people had communist sympathies, whereas yeah. canceling someone for being racist, like oh, you literally tweeted this. <laughs> yeah, and, like, like, oh, like in, in Mel Gibson's case, you literally said this in a voice message. Like this yeah. is you saying this, and there's no denying it. This is not um, like you can't like it's not like oh, you may have communist sympathies. It's like no, you're just racist. Like you're just yeah. like an asshole. Um, so it, it's a little bit harder, and I also do think this is probably this is his weakest movie. Um, I think this is where. And this might sound a little worse, and I do want to know your thoughts on it. I think it gets a little high on his own supply on this movie a little bit. It's two hours and 40 minutes, and it does not need to be two hours and 40 minutes long. Um, What did you think about this movie on a rewatch? Because we were both like, oh, that was pretty good when we saw it the first time. I think this movie is right, like, is a little more politically complex. Again, I don't know hyper focus on the politics, but then again, maybe he isn't thinking about politics, which is why it's so disoriented. Because there are scenes where the cops have the like, can't, like Vince Bond is like the more level headed conservative guy, probably in real life, and also in this movie where he's like he kind of calls Bill Gibson out, where it's like we could have stopped that bank robbery, but you chose not to because you want this money. And Bill Gibson's like, well, like I'm just trying to defend my family, things like that. <laughs> like the selfish, like Bill Gibson's an incredibly selfish character. I I, I don't think that. And I think Zoller recognizes like the the flaws of of his character like he's not like a good guy mm-hmm. he's probably the most morally complex main character out of the three movies where like his own pride and humors and desire to be in control gets him killed at the end spoilers yeah. um because yeah. like he can't he hates the fact that henry has a video of him yeah. shooting a woman even though he shot her in self-defense basically but still like he can't get it out of his own head and that ultimately causes his downfall yeah and again the don johnson line at the end where it's like you you did go too far like why like what was your point and like could you potentially think like this guy's life is miserable was he just trying to like take it out on this guy who was already in handcuffs because he is so he has no power in real life um i i agree high on his own supply to a certain extent i would say this movie has the least memorable lines out of his Three movies and also, but also the most dialogue. Yeah. Um. So, then again, I do, I do like the calm tension throughout. Like, I, I did like the, the, the banter between Bond and Gibson. They're, they're two A class actors. Like, like political opinions aside, both guys know how to chew up scenery, and yeah. they do it here, um, to expertly at to expert levels. And his best directed movie, I would say as well, the final fight scene, like the setting. With like the sulfur smoke yeah. coming in, it's great. That's so good. Yeah. Um, the way that the bank robbers are shot, like especially when they come into the in the robbery scene where it's like they're like these like they they these like all like silhouetted and like in this white room and like yeah. no one's moving and it's all like still shots. It's so unsettling. Yeah. Um, especially in a rewatch. Um, his best directed movie, I would say, but also probably his worst friend is like my general consensus. That's I think is my best my exact argument as well. It's like it's. There is he's clearly a talent, but I think this is also when I'm like, your next movie will determine, I think, what kind of director you are. Uh, are you gonna be someone who's pushing it like this, who's thinking, like, wow, my movie is without fault? Because like there's arguably some of his biggest strengths in the movie are, are are probably like the villains of the movie. They are legitimately like evil, kind of terrifying. They're they're dressed yes. in like uh like full body, like you can only really see their mouths. They when they're filmed, there's this cold, brutal, like violent detachment from reality. The the first sequence when um when you see one of them where they rob a convenience store where he just like mindlessly kills these people and then just like shoots around the store and it's shot from like the corner. Or yeah. like you said, like 
when they are in the the bank and you see them and they have like the detached voice in the voice recorder and they're like, if you're lying, we'll cut off your testicles. And then like it's like these like little sequences that are like little moments. I'm like, these guys are terrifying. Like these guys are really, mm. really fascinating and they aren't developed or fleshed out at all. They're just like but I like the inhuman. I like how they're inhuman. Like because- I, I don't want them to be fleshed out. I like that element of it. Because you have all three sides of the spectrum. You have uh, Henry and his friend who are like, let's say, chaotic good. Yes. You have uh, the other side. They know they're doing a bad thing, but they kind of have good intentions behind it and they don't want to kill people. They don't want to kill people. You have Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn who are good ish but what are doing it for selfish like they they want to say they, they don't want they just yeah want so it's interesting Vaughn represents like the leaning towards the good side of chaotic neutral and Mel yeah. Gibson leans toward the bad side of chaotic evil neutral. yeah and that's then you exact. have the pure chaotic evil yeah it's with like the, with it's the like robbers. chaotic good lawful evil chaotic evil yeah and you get the, these three different standoffs and you know what I'm honestly fine with it like I I, I I'm fine with it. it it really is just like I paused this movie and I was like I have like 45 minutes to go like I was like, it was right before the final sequence. I was like, okay, like sure, but it is like, I also think that these are his worst written characters. Uh, a lot of the characterization out is seems to be like Vince Vaughn just going anchovies in instead of swearing, and Mel Gibson just spouting percentages. And like it's oh I I love the scene where he's where he's applying the 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 gra- the oh, yeah. hair dye. He's like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's that, or it's like Vince Vaughn's like, what's my percentage of getting out alive? And Mel Gibson's like, me, 85, you, 70. And Vince Vaughn's like, okay. <laughs> and he's like, sure. And But it's like a lot of like genuinely really good characterization, I think, in his other two movies are just not here. Um, yeah, I think the movie spends too much time with them just like in the car. Or it's like, I, I wish like they did like one case before the police brutality scene or something like that. So you get an idea, you get a better idea of like their at home lives. They do, they do kind of rush through the home lives just to get them in the car. And I love the scenes where they're just talking in the car and like yeah. about random stuff. But um, yeah, other two movies take so much time to develop the characters before the incident happens. that it's kind of weird that he kind of jumps right into the incident. Here. Yeah. I, I don't like, and, and like Henry and, and his friend disappear. Like I forgot, for like a yeah. long stretch of the middle of the movie. And like, I was like, oh wait, yeah, they're driving the van. Like, yeah. I um, it's, it's structurally really fascinating because the movie opens with um, Henry's character, right? Yeah. It goes Henry's character who who comes home from prison and is like, I'm going to get my family like out of like, uh, out of, I'm going to make give him a better situation. And then it goes to Mel Gibson's character and then it goes to like, the bad guy and you get these three interwoven narratives that come together at the end and structurally like it's like wow it's like he's trying for something here he's he's going outside of like the the atypical like like journey into hell and rather trying to like fit these more interwoven narratives and you know what this might just be a movie in in 30 years as craig zoller has made like eight movies and we might look back and be like oh yeah this is the turning point when he really tried to step it up and we look back at this more more fondly but as it serves right now as like the last movie he's done in the last six years, it, it's messy. It, it's a it's a lot more messy than I realized, and it it has way more fa- flaws than I realized too. Um, yeah. Um, I will say though, I like how in the final fight, like people are acting logically. Like it's very, it feels like a game of chess to a certain extent, like where everyone's moving to certain positions. Yeah. Um, especially when Mel Gibson's on his own by the end. And like, yeah. he's like, he's like, he's like leaning on top of the van and it's like all like, and like the yellow streetlights behind him. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, that man is almost 16 this movie. How is, yeah. how, how is, is that real? That? Yeah. He, and honestly, like the, the strategy of like the hostage being a fake, yeah. a fake uh, escape attempt to shoot one of them is yeah. is genuinely really great. And I mean, the way they play it out is like, we have your family, like we know where you are. If you don't do this, we'll kill your family. And Vince Vaughn, like he like assumes the best too. He's like, he's like, come on, Miss, whatever, come over here, everything's gonna yeah. be okay, and then gets shot. And he gets shot, um, and then like he he dies knowing his his girlfriend didn't want to marry him. <laughs> it's, yes, it's really like it's yeah, it's very interesting to like to like. What, like what mental state was Dollar in? Like watching I don't know. this movie, I don't know because it's like it's very, uh, it's far more nihilistic than Brawl yeah. Tomahawk ninety nine because Brawl Tomahawk ninety nine is a man like doing whatever he can and ultimately like he doesn't and get even Brawl Tomahawk like Brawl Tomahawk is like these four people are risking their lives yeah. to save their own you know village, and they do and they win people. yeah and they win at the end and I guess one person does win at the end and it is I guess technically the person who who needs it the most yeah. I mean the chaotic evil doesn't win and the lawful evil doesn't win and it's the chaotic good that ends up winning and 
I, I do like the sequences. I, I do. I don't say like this movie is entirely bad um, in any capacity. I, I would like say it's good. Like, I think it's like a solid four out of five stars. It's just like the, 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 the bad or like the, 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 uh, myst the mystery behind mm -hmm. it, like the gray area of the movie is more interesting to, to talk about than the good. Cause the good we've already talked about Zala. Like he, again, really good dialogue, really well directed, very tense throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. Um, great violence. He knows how to do violence really well. Um, it's just, yeah, there's like the movie feels like it's taking more risk and those risks are interesting to talk about. Do you, what do you think of the contrast that Zeller is trying to do between like Henry and his, uh, oh my God, what's his friend's name? Uh, Henry and his friend's name uh, when they're driving in the car with the, the 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 bad guys in the back versus like yeah. Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn because there's they're truly, they're clearly trying to contrast the two. I mean, they have like a really like Henry and his friend have like a very like nice conversation. Biscuit. And Biscuit. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Henry yeah. and Biscuit have like a genuine like, hey, you remember that time? And Vince Vaughn and Mel Gibson are like, we got to fucking like, what do you think of the contrast? Like, is there anything that really stood out to you about this movie? I just think it's more character building stuff. I don't think there's any thing more to dissect about it. I just think it's like fleshing out the characters and their relationship. That's just how I saw a little bit. But yeah. I do want to talk about um, Jackson. The most, what was the point of this? What was like, I'm, I'm curious. Like, what do you think? Like, what was, the I think point? it was to make the bad guys seem more evil. Should you, can, should you contextualize what exactly happens in the movie? Cause like, it, it's really like out of nowhere. Yeah. So it, it cuts to Jennifer Carpenter's character who works at a bank and she's used up all of her maternity leave and all of her sick time. Um, and literally has to go to work, um, uh, at the bank. And it just happens when she comes in is when the robbery happens. And, uh, one of her one of her colleagues is trying to send an email to warn the police, and she tries to stop him from sending the email, and then gets shot and killed for the effort. And I watched a video where someone was like, "How it's like this like takedown of um like women in the workplace," which I completely disagree with. First of all, the guy, I think in the video, this the guy is saying he's a stay at home dad, which isn't true. He makes less money than she does. And so he's staying home because she literally used up all of her maternity time and like has to go to work. Yeah. And so I think it's like a good thing that I think it's like a weird, like dark humor on Zoller's part. I think so too. Yeah. Like that's the only thing I can think of here. But like at the same time, she goes to work and everyone's super supportive of her and happy for her and they get her cupcakes. So it's not like she comes to work and she's miserable. Like she has a great workplace. Everyone supports her. And then the husband buys her flowers. And pictures of the baby and there, like the sets baby. it up. So it's yeah. not like this takedown. I think of like of like the change in gender norms of the of the twenty tens to twenty twenties. Like yeah. I think that's completely inaccurate. I think it's like one on one hand, it's just to set up the villains. On other hand, high on his own supply. Like let's just be honest. That's, yeah, that's yeah, like it's, that's, it's crazy. And plus, like you know, he employs women to work as actresses in his movie, so it's like clearly he supports. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. I, I guarantee Jennifer Carpenter makes more money than her husband. Like, yeah, she's like a fairly successful actress. Who, like, this is the, this is the, it's the weirdest thing in the movie. And I remember when we watched it for the first time, we're like, we're more shocked by it. We're yeah. watching it now. It's like, it's like it's a it's bold. It's genuinely bold because you go from like this tight, tense narrative to just this random woman, and it's like yeah. a four minute sequence where she's arguing like. Her husband won't let her in. She's like, he's like, you have to go to work. Like, she's clearly incredibly anxious about leaving her baby, and you're, and it then it just ends with her being murdered. And you're like, well, it it does it feels very like dark humor and dark. Nothing wrong with dark humor, mm. uh, and nothing wrong with like the cold cynicism and irony of it. But it's the movie's two hours and forty minutes, and it's like an extra five minutes that are just like I don't like. Okay, sure, it's like it's this odd emotional weird manipulation to make the villain scarier because you're like wow look they just killed this mother it's it's odd it's odd i don't i don't really know how i, how yeah. I feel about it and it might take a couple more watches before i fully like process it mm. all right well <laughs> that's drag across concrete i want to like close the discussion with a question um is we're almost halfway through the 2020s like after this year we'll be halfway through the 2020s it does the 2020s lack an S. Craig Zoller type. Yeah. Or when we talk about Jeremy Saldanier at some point later on, we do all of his movies. Like, does it feel like the 2010s, does it feel like the 2020s lack like these like, like kind of like low key indie directors that are just making like weird stuff? Does COVID, it feel like the 2020s yeah. doesn't have that? COVID fucked everything up. Yeah. COVID ruined shit. Cause like, I mean, COVID and the strikes, like we, we, 
Like, I don't know how you make a movie. I mean, like 2020 was a historically bad movie year. And that's when we started mm-hmm. like getting into film frauds and doing movies yeah. and stuff like that. I don't know. What do you think? Like, this is like, you are more of the genre guy out of us. Like I'm more of the watch Aloha and question why I'm doing this kind of guy. Um, Like what, like, cause for you as someone who I think more like enjoys like these genre type of movies, he's kind of mm-hmm. like specialty kind of stuff. I mean, do you feel like movies as a whole, like, would you see, like, I don't want to talk, we can, we can talk about Oppenheimer another time, but um, like if F. Craig Zoller was making a movie, like, are you seeing that in theaters? Like if it's in theaters around you, like, how, how yeah, you I, I saw this? he did a blog post like last month where he said that he, he finally is going to be announcing a new movie coming nice. out. Okay. So I'll, I'll be seeing that and I'll, if I get seen in theaters, I'll see it in theaters as well, or I'll pay for it on Amazon to rent it. But yeah, yeah it, I don't feel like the 2020 is just, I can't think of like, like Kid Detective comes to mind is like this movie that kind of like came out of nowhere and like this really interesting like character drama that with like really like uh, like an undertone of like weird violence to it yeah. but like i can't think of like a like a jeremy salmir or a zoller equivalent to come out of the early 2020s so far i mean it feels like it's like it's like big movies and then also like but like or like indie movies with um like i don't know it just it feels like it's lacking like a movie with like grit like an indie movie with grit where you're it's just like, like you're killer? like holy crap how did this come out but the killer is a day of fincher movie yeah that's the thing is like that the, is yeah, that the I'm... closest we have to that recently of like a movie that came out of nowhere and we're like who is this who's doing this i, I like getting kid detective is the only movie that like immediately comes to my mind of like and, and you're getting it abroad like i love the anatomy of the fall i think anatomy of the fall is the best movie of 2023 for me um and that movie felt like it was daring to a certain extent where it's like it's a lot of it is what you could determine on your own. But again, like I wouldn't say like, like Zoller is a similar filmmaker to Triette. Like Zoller and Somnir are just like different animals, like with uh, what they, what they do. And we do, when we do Somnir, it'll be another interesting discussion because he's another filmmaker who has not made a movie yeah. in years and his had a very productive 2010s. His last what? one, his last one was bad. Yeah. That his whole the dark one, was bad. Yeah. But like, I'd rather a bad Somnir movie than no Somnir. Like, yeah. Than him just being radio silent, basically. Do you think it's um, TV, though? Do you think it's like we're getting this stuff on? Maybe because, again, the same thing happened with Taylor Sheridan. Like he has he's making a ton of TV shows and miniseries, which I could watch. But it's like I, I want like another Wind River or another Sicario yeah. or another High or High Water. I just want that min- min- that medium budget movie with like star power that's character driven. And we just don't, like I just feel like we haven't really gotten they that. Don't, they don't make money. And it's like the thing of like it's that argument of like if Esther Zoller makes a movie, um, one, I hope it plays in our state. Like it might not. Like yeah. I was fortunate enough where I could live in L.A. And like major theaters or small theaters were around me. Like I got to see uh, my biggest success that I feel like when I was there was I got to see Noah Baumbach's White Noise when it was in theaters. Um, I love mm. that. Like I got to see Raging Bull in theaters. Like, I got to see a lot of different kind of like cool stuff. But like I hope they played in our state if he makes another movie. And like we also have to be willing to like pay the money to go see it. Like it's hard now. And these type of movies don't make money. Like we like we want to see Promised Land, and that we probably will have to drive an hour to go see Promised Land. Yeah, we definitely will have to drive. Right? An hour. we'll have to drive an hour yeah. to the city to go see it. Yeah, yeah. it's just not. It sucks. I don't know. Like, twenty twenty three was also like the year that movies kind of came back a little bit, and now twenty twenty four is just like a shit show again because of the post strikes and everything that got moved. So now we're just kind of waiting. But I, maybe is like is the last good movie, but that's twenty tens. Like get even out. like who is the director of the Raid. Oh, uh, Gareth Evans. I yeah, guess like Apostle? he's had a movie with Tom Hardy that's been in development for oh, years, yeah. and it's Forgot like it's that. gone ready to silent on that. And it's like, what's like all these like kind of like edgy filmmakers of the 2010s are all just like scrambling to <laughs> to, to get something. funding, not even to like put their movies in development, just for funding. And it's really sad. Yeah. Do you remember Apostle? I'd love to revisit that. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd like to revisit a, a Apostle as well. Yeah, that point. was. I remember that being a good movie or like a decent yeah. movie. Or I, mean, I remember like, you, didn't, you didn't like that because it's like it goes from like from like real like oh shit horror to like there's that one action scene where the camera like whips yeah, around. Yeah, like the guy, like the, the, the kid's girlfriend gets brutally murdered in front of him. And then it goes like Mortal Kombat, like, <laughs> zoom out, well, let's fight. Yeah, <laughs> I remember. I remember we watched that and you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like to revisit I, that movie, but yeah, I don't know. Um, Maybe I'm just not opened. Like maybe it's not. Maybe I'm not aware. But you're more aware of like movies coming out than I do, and you can't think of really 
that a that monkey many man? examples. Like, I gotta be honest. But like, it's not out yet. You don't know if it's a good movie I don't know if it's gonna be good or not. In that movie, like, it's uh, it, like it really just kind of sucks. Like, it, I miss, I do miss, and I mean, we we talk about this like every episode where it's like we clearly have a we're developing like a taste in movies, and it's movies that are non conventional, and it's movies that are non conventional because like. I don't need to go see Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny to see like a three hundred million dollar bomb. That's probably it's just not that good. Like yeah. I got to be honest. Like I want to. I mean, see like the- Robert Eggers and Yorgos Lanthimos, and like Yorgos is the only one who's like whose movies make money. <laughs> His poor things made a hundred. <laughs> poor things crossed a hundred million. By the way, it it well, like it poor yeah. things like actually is making money, but like also like Zone of Interest. Zone of Interest is a movie that is a is apparently like when, if we ever get to Glazer. Um, Thankfully, it's coming to a theater near me in March where they're playing the best picture movies. Um, so like Meister's gonna be back in theaters, I- American Fiction's gonna be back in theaters. Like these movies are just hard to see. Like, and it, it's like it sucks for us because we want to see them. And we want we're to lucky see when we were in college, we had like an art, like an art cinema yeah. nearby that like it played. I remember we saw um we saw Alien there. Yeah, we saw Alien, but we saw like Death of Stalin, which never was sick. Yeah. yeah, that's all, but like we also weren't. Like as into movies as yeah, now, now we can appreciate it. Stuff, so we, <laughs> we fucked up. We we were, yeah. we didn't realize how much it was. Um, no, Esker Gazelle was one of my favorite filmmakers working in the past like decade. Um, even his not great as great movie is still better than a lot of other movies I watched. And it's just like it seems like the movies we like, we just have to really dig for them and really try to find them. And it's interesting because there's also like a, I feel like movies are being controlled by like a smaller amount of directors and those directors are just allowed to make them as long as possible. And then when they bomb, we're like, Oh, are our cinematic, our cinematic driven directors are the, is it a dying art? Well, maybe because your movie's three and a half hours long, people yeah. don't want to see it. I mean, that's not the only reason, but I think it is a like, like your movie, not just because it's three hours, people don't want to see, but because it's three hours and making a third movie is expensive to do. It's expensive. It's um, a lot. Yeah. Yes. So it, it's interesting. Like again, Yorgos, it's like the only one whose movies he gets weirder and weirder, but yeah. like and like more expensive. But the movies make money, so I, I, he's like he's like this weird anomaly of like a guy who just makes whatever he wants. Yeah, and they always make more money than the last movie. Um, how packed was your? Uh, I think we talked about this, but how packed was your Poor Things theater again? When you I saw, saw it late, and it was still had a decent amount of people. Like I it was like it one too. showing on a Saturday, and I saw it, and like it had a good crowd. It yeah. was weird. Um, I had that too. I saw it a couple weeks late in LA, and it was a basically sold out theater, and people loved it. People yeah. recognize like. It all comes down to this: make good movies. Like I gotta be honest. Like what's I don't the best- it doesn't come down to that though because. Bone Tomahawk and Ron Sublock, these movies that we just talked about didn't make money. But how do you market them? Like, that's the thing is like, hey. But you said, like, make good movies. Like, again, they made they make good movies. So think about this thing. Like, they do make good movies and and good movies always bomb and stuff like that. That's the nature of it. But like, I watched Argyle. I'm stupid. I went and paid money. Argyle is a garbage movie. It's a bad movie. And it's two hundred million dollars. Yeah. But like, there's a new. Do you know there's a Cohen? There's like movie these, out? like there's like these directors, like Zack Snyder, Matthew Vaughn, and Guillermo del Toro, who make who do, movies bomb. Like, don't put you don't Guillermo del Toro into this. Don't put Guillermo del Toro. But into he's. I'm, I'm just saying, regardless <laughs> of you like his movies, they don't make any money. They no one sees money. them, and they're always a hundred million dollars. Remember yeah. Crimson Peak? Remember how expensive that movie was, uh, yeah, and then no one saw it. Yeah, forever. Like that, yeah. again, like these movies, these directors. You know, you got you got to be in. You got to be on the end, basically. You I know, mean, Esker Zoller. Yeah. If, if es- excuse me, if S. Craig Zoller is given one quarter of the budget Guillermo del Toro gets to make his boring movies, like, can you imagine the kind of movie he would make with yeah. a quarter of Guillermo del Toro's budget? A quarter. The, this is like, like <laughs> the, I know. Yeah, I mean, they'll make the same amount of money. <laughs> yeah, it'll, be, it'll make under like I can't believe Dragon Cost Concrete fifteen million budget and made less than a million dollars in the box. Yeah. Up. But like, I don't remember what theater it was in when it came. Like we again, we had to use other means to watch it. But I mean, I've yeah. I've bought it now. Like it, it's good. Like we, but. Yeah, I know it's complicated. Like, but this is thing that was like, what are the the top three movies of like that were made money last year? Were Super Mario Brothers, Barbie, and Oppenheimer. And regardless of your thoughts on Oppenheimer, the fact that our rated three hour plus biopic made a basically a billion dollars is awesome. Like, yeah, regardless it's, of your it's thoughts, definitely an exception. Like, it 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 just the bar like the Barbenheimer marketing definitely. Was, yeah, it was crazy. Captured. You get to like go, you get to go through memes. To it's, get your yeah. movie, have your movie make money now, it's it is so sad. Like once upon a time in Hollywood, do you think that movie's more known for the movie or the Leonardo DiCaprio meme? It's probably I more, bet known more people for the saw meme. it like on video on demand because they wanted to be in on the meme than of because meme. of yeah. like Tarantino made the movie. 
But Tarantino is one of the last filmmakers who's, again, what we were just talking about, like when he says something, it makes national news. Yeah. Like his movies still make money. Even Scorsese has lost that with, with like the broader yeah. like film um, people who are in the know. Like, you know, Gilles of Auburn didn't make that much money and, you know, didn't capture, like, you know, when a Tar when the film critic comes out, people are going to care. Um, they better so care. It's, it's so interesting um, how you... that works. Because, I mean, once upon a time, it's starred Leonardo DiCaprio. It was Flower Moon starred Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah. So you can't say it's lack of star power. Do you, uh, I got a couple more things to say and then we'll we'll, we'll let people go. Yeah. Do you know, you know how they're making Gladiator 2? Yeah. Do you know? Again, another director who makes, I mean, like, I love Ridley Scott. He's you one of love the most Gladiator, filmmakers. Though. No, I don't like, I, I think Glad, Gladiator is a bad movie. I don't think, um, I don't like it either. I think it's fine. I, I watched Pompeii with, <laughs> with, you know, known hack. Wait, sorry. We got to pause for a second. <laughs> My mom's about to come in with groceries. Okay. I <laughs> I'm a, I'm I'm firing up this rant right now. You're firing now. up your rant. Yeah. Pompeii is better than Gladiator. Yeah. <laughs> so I watch I watch Pompeii with with known hack Paul Thomas Paul W S Anderson. Yeah. And that movie has better gladiator gladiatorial sequences than Gladiator does. Like much better. Gladiator is um, an interesting movie. Gladiator is a cringe movie. It's it has like a great opening with like all the things we do today will echo in eternity. Like they fight the the Germans, or, I think, and then. The rest of the movie is just bad. It's boring. Do you know? Um, okay, a couple things real quick. Do you know the Gladiator Two budget initially was? Is it like two hundred million? It was one hundred and sixty million, and there are conflicting reports. But some reports say it's ballooned to three hundred and ten million, while some of the executives in like Paramount, I think, is producing it, uh, say it's under two hundred and fifty. But like Joker Two, first one cost sixty million dollars to make. The second one's costing two hundred million dollars to make. Like there, these movies are getting these insane budgets. Like Joker, fine movie. It's not great. It's not mm. bad. It's fine. It's whatever. It's a, it's a whatever movie. But yeah. Do you also know real quick that uh, like movies like this, like uh, Inurita is making another movie. Do you know who his lead's going to be? Who? Tom Cruise. I am so down for this. I am I, so I, down I, for that too. But even um, how much is Bong Joon-ho's new movie? That's like really Mickey, under wraps. But Mickey 17 got delayed until January 2025. Be no. Because... Zaslav for <laughs> Warner Brothers, like, do you know what the go is going on with the Coyote versus Acme movie? No. So it's a movie that has been finished, and they it was a seventy to eighty million dollar movie about like Looney Tunes or something like that. That is finished. It's done. Apparently, the people who've seen it think it's really good, and they're they're getting rid of it. They're writing it off for a tax write off, and and it's just gone. And the issue is, is that Bong Joon Ho is working with Warner Brothers, and uh, nobody really knows what's going on with Mickey Seventeen, but it was supposed to come out this year. And then got pushed to January thirty first, twenty twenty five, like the shit month. So like yeah. nobody, nobody really F knows January month. But Bong Joon Ho also apparently has already started development on another movie. He's making an animated movie. It's going to be one of the most expensive South Korean movies ever made. Like it's that movie is so weird in development, and it might just be a really weird movie. Like a lot of really different, interesting stuff are happening, but they're just ballooned. Like we don't have like these movies anymore. They. Like, I'm excited for Megalopolis, Francis Ford Coppola's movie. That's like he budgeted himself outside of like a studio system. Like, it's it's interesting. It seemed like the Beanie Budget movie made a little bit of a comeback during the pandemic because of streaming services. Yeah. But the problem is that no one saw any of the movies on streaming services. So everyone's like, oh, these movies no one cares about. And then yeah. any any director that could have made like that could have made a name on their medium budget movie just got lost in the shuffle again. Yeah. Um. When so. When you're when you're like I think what was the most streamed movie wasn't it like a Jennifer Lopez movie or something like that like the mother oh yeah it was I like, mean like that... maybe um Sam Esmail might have a productive 2020 2020s oh yeah because his movie because of his movie. Leave the World Behind was an unexpected success yeah so like fingers crossed but fingers crossed. I mean who knows he might have a movie planned he might be like six months deep into filming and then it gets canned because they want to use the tax write off we don't know yeah yeah <sighs> so this started off as an S Craig Soller discussion and turned into a uh a more depressing examination yeah. on what movies are now, but yeah. we will be back. Uh, we are figuring out what we're probably going to do for the next couple of weeks, um, but we will be back again. Matt, yeah. this is really fun. We will definitely be doing this again with uh, Saul Nair, Jeremy yeah. Saul Nair, because he's also like a three movie director who is in the same vein as like hyper genre. I'm, I'm, I'll be really interested in that discussion because hold the dark is not a good movie. No, it, no, it's not a good movie. Uh, Matt, do you have any final things to say? Any final points? Any any things to to let people know? Um, are we doing Lego the Lego movie next? 
We should do. We should probably do one of those. Modern classic because it's like ten year anniversary, right? Is it really? Oh my god! You texted it. me that. Texted I did. That. I did. Yeah, I forgot about that. Uh, yeah, we'll figure that out. We'll we'll okay. figure it out off camera. So nobody, if you guys okay. are still listening to this, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Matt. Where no can you find us? Far. <laughs> you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. And our letterbox links are also in the description. Yeah. So if you want to get your your thoughts on our on our thoughts on movies below before we talk about them, yep. There you go. Yeah, just have to look at my account because I'll post like six reviews at once, and you'd be like, "Oh, <laughs> yeah. I missed." Like I watched I Tanya, so you know. <laughs> you watched right. Aloha. So I did really. watch Aloha. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you guys for listening. This has been fun. This might be our longest episode. Uh, yes around 90 minutes i think so yeah enjoy uh but thank you guys for listening and uh fuck you guys and goodbye